Hey friends, welcome back to the journal feed. My name is Nick Zelt, and this is the only place to get spoon-fed the latest and greatest of emergency medicine. We just want to make you guys up to date on the literature, and to do that, we spoon-feed it to you. Now, if you are hearing this right now, then you are not currently a Journal Feed subscriber, and so you're not getting the full Journal Feed podcast, only getting a portion of the past week's articles. Don't worry, they're all good articles. But if you would like to get full access to both the podcast and the blog, then you'll have to become a member. All the details for that are at journalfeed.org. And remember, we never want money to be a barrier to better patient care. So if you're having any trouble affording a subscription, reach out, we'll help you out. This is the audio version of our past week summaries, which this week were brought to you by Samuel Rouleau and Clay Smith. So here's the first article titled Reducing the Risk of Nuclear War, the Role of Health Professionals out of the JAMA. That's right, you heard correctly, nuclear war. I spend most of my time thinking about nuclear stuff in the context of that I kind of personally think that it's the way for us for powering our planet. Forget solar, wind, coal on large scales, hydroelectric can probably stay. But we're not talking about power generation, in my opinions, on that. We are talking about war. The UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres warned that we are at the highest risk of nuclear danger since the Cold War. Now, I'm not saying too much that your role as a healthcare provider directly relates to the risk of nuclear war. But you're still a citizen of this planet, and physicians are well-educated and influential citizens at that. This article outlines some ways in which we could help. As physicians, we are trusted voices, and that can help to inform the public and our leaders about the risk of nuclear war. The current estimate is that there are roughly 13,000 nuclear weapons worldwide. If even 250 of these, that's just 2% of the overall stock, if these were fired, that could cost upwards of 120 million people's lives outright, and another 2 billion at risk for nuclear famine. If the US and Russia engaged in an all-out nuclear war, hundreds of millions would die instantly, and then the majority of the rest of the planet would likely die in a nuclear winter. We don't need to just stop making nuclear warheads. We have plenty of them already. What we need to do is start getting rid of the ones that already exist. Now, there's an organization of physicians, the International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War, which are working on educating policymakers, working towards a treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons, and just overall trying to calm the problem of nuclear war. Their current call to action is threefold. To adopt a no-use policy for the use of nuclear weapons, to take these nuclear weapons off the hair trigger alert, and then to have many countries publicly pledge not to use nuclear weapons in current conflicts. One step further would be to establish a plan for the destruction of the existing nuclear weapons. Quite honestly, a nuclear war would pretty much just be cutting off your nose to spite your face. It would really destroy our planet and kill way, 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 way too many people. Let's not do something silly. In a spoonful, if you're looking for a cause to support then, you know, this could be a good one. The IPPNW supports donations, probably a worthy cause. And then the second article titled Prevalence of and Eligibility for Surveillance Without Anticoagulation Among Adults with Low-Risk Acute Subsegmental Pulmonary Embolism out of the JAMA Network Open. As Ken Milne would put it, this article is hot off the press, since the author of this summary happens to be the author of the source article itself. Shameless self-promotion, Samuel. I love it. Not to say that this isn't still a very relevant article for all of us. In recent years, we've been identifying more and more pulmonary embolisms. Scanners get better and better, and so we're finding smaller clots that we probably wouldn't have seen before. So, uh, when you find a small subsegmental PE, there's an argument that perhaps not all of these actually require anticoagulation. After all, there is, of course, a risk to anticoagulating someone. These subsegmental PEs account for about 8% of all PEs, so they're actually happening fairly often. Here we have a retrospective study of 21 Kaiser Permanente emergency departments over 5 years. From this cohort, 666 outpatients with isolated subsegmental PEs were identified, 229 of which were determined to be low risk based on vital signs and comorbidities. The authors applied the American College of Chest Physician guidelines on these low-risk patients to determine which of these low-risk patients might be able to just be monitored rather than anticoagulated. This monitoring, or structured surveillance as they call it, consisted of repeat imaging within two weeks of the original diagnosis. 
either with a compression ultrasound of the lower extremities or a CTPA. From their data set, 15% of these lower risk patients, and that's 5% of the overall patients, would be eligible for this observation approach without anticoagulation according to the CHEST guidelines. This is much more than people are currently doing, since in the cohort only six patients had surveillance without anticoagulation, and only one of those had the recommended structured surveillance with follow-up and repeat imaging. This is a, it's a great idea, but without well-defined pathways incorporated into hospital systems, and of course data to strongly support this surveillance approach, I don't think it's going to be widely adopted. For good or for worse, the emergency medicine world is biased towards action. So inaction will have to be clearly the right choice before it's going to be used a lot. There are trials in progress that might provide that data, though. In this windfall, not as many patients with subsegmental PEs are being observed rather than anticoagulated as they could be according to the CHEST guidelines. But it still feels pretty cowboy to me to not anticoagulate these patients when recurrence rates are higher than we'd probably like them to be. And then we have the third article, titled Outdoor Cold Air versus Room Temperature Exposure for Croup Symptoms, a randomized control trial out of the journal Pediatrics. We've all seen it. I know you've seen it. It's the equivalent of having a medical student take a history and then their supervisor asking the exact same question and the patient giving a completely different answer. It's kind of like gaslighting. Parents wake up because their child is breathing like the Darth Vader without his helmet on. They freak out and rush to the hospital. But by the time they get their child to the hospital, their child is back to looking like a perfectly adorable baby Yoda, and they have no obvious problem to point to for why they brought them there. That is croup for you. And all this time, we've been saying that it's the cold outdoor air that cures the child. But has this ever really been tested? And if it is true, couldn't we be using it as a treatment? Dexamethasone and nebulized epinephrine, I don't really care if it's racemic or not, are the mainstays of treatment for croup. Mist has been attempted. It doesn't help. But what about cold air? It sure seems like it would work. This trial was an unblinded RCT of 118 children with at least mild croup. These children all got dexamethasone, of course, but that doesn't work for hours, so there's still some time to, you know, try some stuff out. The children were randomized to just sit and wait in an outdoor area that was pretty cold, about 10 degrees Celsius, or waiting in an indoor area that was room temperature for 30 minutes. The Wesley Croup score severity decreased by 2 points in 50% of the cold group, and only 24% of the room temperature group. This was highly significant, obviously that's a risk difference of 25%, and the biggest effect was in those with moderate symptoms. If only they had blinded this study, then we'd actually have really good evidence on our hands here. This is particularly important in a situation like this because people genuinely believe in the effect of cool air to cure croup symptoms. Of course, you can't blind the child or the family, but you could have blinded the doctors, probably. This works, I mean, great for me. I live in Canada, and croup is much more common when it's cold out. I like it. Sadly, for those who live near the equator, ah, you know, it stays warm all year round. This probably isn't going to work for you unless you have a walk-in freezer. I mean, poor you, though. It's warm all year round. Boo-hoo. In a spoonful, cold air actually does improve croup symptoms. And that's pretty cool. Not sure the effect is long-lasting, though, but uh, either way, you're going to give them dex. All right, that's all the articles. Let's do our quick uh, summary. Now, from the first article, nuclear war is everyone's problem, even physicians. Speak out against it any chance you get and support the effort to destroy stockpiles of nuclear weapons. In the second article, surveillance is an option for subsegmental PEs. There are even chest guidelines to support this, but it's not commonly being done. And it, when it is being done, it's not really being done as recommended. Hopefully, future research uh, will give us more guidance. Then from the third article, bringing your kid out in the cold air of winter really could improve croup symptoms. Again, if you're hearing this, then you're not a part of the members feed, and so you missed two articles from this past week. One was about PPIs and how they're not necessarily so harmless in children, and the other was about preventative medicine. Should we be screening for suicide risks? Links to all the articles summarized can be found at journalfeed.org, where the newsletter is the best way to make the podcast into a bite-sized nugget of space repetition. Our goal here is for you to read less, learn more, and save lives, one spoonful at a time. Thank you.